So as more factions and data sheets get the limelight in 40k 10th edition, we can see a fair few more trends as to how the rules are actually going to be applied. Let's talk about four major shifts away from 9th edition that might be only visible by their absence. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking over a few trends from 40k 10th edition, a few interesting things in 10th edition that seem to be either present or absent on data sheets. So far, Games Workshop have been keeping the core of ills and the faction mechanics coming for us. It's really quite easy to understand the changes when it's literally one rule being changed to a different way of working, or a new big faction rule that will affect the way that an entire army will play. But there will be quite a lot of subtle things in the data sheets that maybe aren't apparent until we see the whole lot of them. Things like which unique rules, buffs, and debuffs are commonly spread among the unique abilities of the many armies of 40k. Maybe in particular for 9th edition, examples of that might be the fight's last rule, which was really quite a big deal to a bunch of armies, but wouldn't be at all apparent from the core mechanics. And also things like minus one damage, a powerful defensive buff common to a whole bunch of units, but also not really obvious in the core rules. Today I thought we'd just talk about four of these examples that are maybe only obvious by their absence in all the rules that we've seen so far. It does mean that we can't 100% confirm that some of these mechanics are dead or anything, but when a whole bunch of units previewed lose a rule, I feel like it's kind of indicative. First up, we've got Assault Weapons, something that was really quite a common class of weapon in Warhammer 40k 8th and 9th edition, but seems to be much, much rarer in 10th. I feel like this maybe has partly to do with a game design choice that they've got. In 8th edition, 9th edition, and before in Warhammer 40k, they basically had a system where literally every single weapon in the game had to have special rules of one sort or another, because it had to be classified as things like Rapid Fire, Assault, Heavy, or Pistol. For that reason, it meant that a whole load of weapons just got the assault keyword just kind of by default, things that it didn't really make sense to be too limited on the move via the heavy keyword, and things that just didn't really make sense to be rapid fire weapons and being able to double the amount of shots within half range. Basically, if neither of those things made sense, it had to be an assault weapon, which meant that the unit carrying it would gain a bunch of movement and could still fire. I did find it kind of weird that the Leagues of Votan Hunter weapons were basically a special class that Games Workshop had to write some rules for and the rules amounted to those weapons based in functioning as none of the above classes, just literally weapons that you can move and shoot, but you can't advance and shoot with them like assault weapons. Just seems a bit funny that you have to write rules to say that this weapon basically has no rules. It seems that in 10th edition though, actually perhaps the majority of weapons in the game are basically going to be Votan Hunter weapons now. Weapons that you can move and fire normally, get their appropriate amount of shots up to maximum range, and besides rules that might impact their damage dealing, they just don't really have any other special rules going on, like doubling their fire at half range, worsening your ballistic skill if you move, or allowing you to advance and shoot like assault weapons. It does seem that things like heavy weapons are rarer as well. But perhaps the most notable thing in my opinion is the absence of the assault keyword on a whole load of things that used to have it, basically meaning that these short range guns just aren't going to have as much of an effective threat range anymore. I'm probably missing a few examples here and there, but some of the ones that I noticed were things like basic flamers, particularly relevant as they auto hits and were 12 inch range, they didn't care about the minus one to hit at all. Seems the same for melter guns as well, the Necron Gauss Reapers, which have got nice damage and short range, very relevant for them as Necron Warriors only move 5 inches normally. The Admec Radium Carbines also seem to have lost it, though they can gain it back easily enough with the Conqueror Imperative. The standard Tyranid Flesh Borers have lost it, and so have aggressive Bolt Storm Gauntlets. I'd say how much it really mattered for some of these guns does vary a bit between each one. Some of them you really wanted to be able to advance and shoot, as it was more important to get closer to the enemy or get in range. And it was also quite a big difference for armies that varied in ballistic skill. Assault weapons moving and advancing was a much worse idea if your ballistic skill was 4+, plus, compared with if you were hitting on a 3. I think I wouldn't underestimate the loss of threat range of these guns though. I feel like it's definitely a big blow to certain weapons like the Necron Gauss Reaper compared with the Gauss Flayer. I feel like for weapons that do get it though, the assault keyword is going to be quite a big deal now. And from Games Workshop's previews so far, it seems that you get no minus 1 to hit penalty if you advance and shoot with these weapons now. It's kind of interesting the things that do get it compared with the ones that don't. It seems at least that the vast majority of just basic faction guns that did have the assault keyword don't have it. But interestingly enough, we've got it on bolt rifles, though not standard bolters, Tyranid spine fists, despite also being pistols. And recently it's present on Eldar shuriken pistols and shuriken catapults, perhaps particularly appropriate for them. And make in general seem to have the most access to it at the moment, as they can have it literally army-wide in Conqueror Doctrina, weighing it up between the ballistic skill boost of the heavy weapon keyword. For the weapons that do have it, I think it really is quite a big deal. It means that you get to move an extra d6 inches towards objectives or the enemy, provided you don't want to charge, and he's still firing to full effect. 
it means that the choice between extra movement and any shooting at all is going to be a much bigger thing for a lot more of these units though. Next up, something interesting that has been spotted a fair bit but Games Workshop haven't really directly addressed it, is that there seems to be a fair bit of consolidation of keywords going from 9th to 10th, and even though we haven't seen any direct previews for Swarms and Beast units, I think there's a pretty high likelihood that they're going to get the Infantry keyword, maybe in addition to the Swarm and Beast ones. Previously, I definitely felt that in 9th edition, some of the special rules that they wrote had to cover a bunch of classes, Maybe in particular things like the cover rules had to specifically talk about infantry beasts and swarms, as those are the units that often made sense to be receiving the benefit of cover. For the rules that needed to specify other things, then it could be a bit clunky as well. You have things like cavalry bikes and tau drones to talk about. And I did feel that all these keywords maybe did complicate things just a little bit more than it perhaps needed to. I noticed in the last tau codex, Games Workshop kind of removed one class, by making the Tau battle suits all also either infantry or vehicles while retaining that keyword. The reason that I suspect that this is the case is the 10th edition terrain rules, which only seem to mention infantry as the keyword and make no mention of either beasts or swarms. I feel it's pretty likely that they've been rolled in for simplicity. They do strike me as units that maybe don't absolutely need their own keyword for extra rules. They might still have swarm or beast in addition, maybe for certain weapons that are good against that sort of thing. But with interactions with terrain and things, and maybe big models stepping over them and stuff, it does kind of make sense to me to just count them as infantry, and then you don't have to talk about three or four different keywords every time you need to talk about terrain. Another example of this was the new mounted keyword that we heard about. This one's maybe a little bit more obvious, a catch-all for bikes and cavalry, both of which are mounted in their own way. Again, they've had similar interactions with terrain and things, usually not being able to do the infantry things of ghosting through ruined walls and stuff, so again, a pretty reasonable one to consolidate into one class in my opinion. I guess it's not impossible that beasts might wind up there, but I'd guess they're more likely to have the infantry tag than the mounted one. Most things with the beast keyword can interact fairly well with terrain at the moment. Maybe easy to imagine things like Fenrisian wolves going around terrain and through windows and things, as opposed to a space marine on a bike unless he's just going really fast and is quite brave. My guess is that anything bigger will either have the monster or vehicle tag as it does at the moment, maybe buildings or fortifications as well I suppose, we haven't really seen them. I guess it's handy enough to be able to differentiate certain weapons between targeting monsters or vehicles, maybe things like the anti-vehicle weapons like the chain fists or the admeg arc weapons. With keywords and things, Games Workshop definitely have the power to differentiate things a lot more. I think other things that have been confirmed for vehicles are things like the aircraft keyword, towering for things that jut above terrain, I'm sure that knights will get that, titanic for super heavies in general, including things like the bane blade with a lower profile, and it looks like there's a walker keyword as well for things like the ballista's dreadnought, will be interesting to see if that impacts any rules or how many things key off that, I think that the only thing that we've seen so far are some crusade rules there. Let me know what you think though, how likely is it that we roll in swarms and beasts to infantry in 10th? Next up, and one that I found kind of funny, is that twin-linked weapons don't always seem to be twin-linked in 10th, and that it's probably a good thing in my opinion. When I made a big summary video of a lot of the major changes that we'd seen in 10th edition so far, the twin-links rule was voted as one of the very least well-received out of any of the new rules, and a lot of people's reaction was, why did you bother changing that Games Workshop, it worked fine before. The new Twin Links rule basically means that the weapon gets half the shots that it did in 9th edition, but it gets to re-roll the wound roll on those shots. Certainly a very powerful rule that's a big damage boost, but it is always going to be weaker than having double the amount of shots. It's not awful and definitely does add more damage output without giving you double damage if that's not what Games Workshop wants, but it did just seem like a bit of a strange decision for a few different reasons to me, perhaps undermining the toughness chart a little bit, making things that aren't very good against vehicles suddenly great against some. It adds more re-rolls to a game that is in theory trying to step away from that a little bit, and it does interact very weirdly with certain powerful rules, particularly anything where you're fishing for a 6 to wound, like say the devastating wounds rule. It also doesn't amazingly stack well with certain other special rules, things like the Space Marine's Oath of Moment, which gives you full wound re-rolls, and Twin Link's weapons don't care about that. As you can tell, I'm maybe not the most enormous fan of the rule, but it does appear that Games Workshop have anticipated one drawback. With the whole strength and toughness chart, it meant that any very high strength Twin Link's weapons would get so much less value out of it, things like the twin last cannons on land raiders, or on a whole load of other big scary guns throughout the game. Full reroll wounds is pretty excellent on anything with kind of mid to low strength, particularly things like heavy bolters, or maybe plasma weapons now, seeing that strength 8 is kind of middling in 40k these days, but it's not going to be great if your strength is absolutely immense, and you're basically wounding everything that you target on a 3 plus or 2 plus anyway, it's just a tiny boost compared with what the weapons that wound on a 5 plus would get, 
To give some credit to them where it's due, it seems that Games Workshop have anticipated that, and interestingly enough, it does mean that not every gun that's got a twin version of it is actually going to have the twin links rule. We've seen a couple of examples of really high power anti-tank weapons, like the twin LAS cannons on the Land Raider, or the Ballista's twin LAS cannons on that new fancy Dreadnought. Neither of those actually have the twin links profile at all, they simply get double the shots as they would normally, and seem to have the standard LAS cannon profile of strength 12, AP3, damage d6 plus 1, no reroll wound rolls, but just two shots. I feel like maybe it's a little bit unintuitive, as some of these guns I feel like are the first thing that I'd think about when I thought about a twin linked weapon. They used to have that rule in the past when it was reroll hit rolls, but I think on balance keeping the twin links rule well away from these last cannons is probably a good idea. It means that all the big twin anti-tank weapons out there don't suddenly have to get almost a half power cut, Probably good news for things like Lam Raiders and Twin Las Cannon Razorbacks, and they can save the Twin Links rule for where it's more effective, with things like the Lam Raiders Heavy Bolters, for example, or Twin Heavy Flamers on the Bane Blade. Finally, one fairly common Ninth Edition rule that we don't seem to have seen any mention of yet is the minus one damage. Definitely something that felt to me a bit like the Ninth Edition Arms Race, a big durability boost that seemed to be picked up by Dreadnought equivalents, plus some of the toughest units in each faction as their codex dropped. Maybe some common examples were things like Hellbrutes, Wraith Units, Carnifexes, Guard Bulgrins, Gene Stealer Cold Aberrants, and Death Guard in general. Plus, even if it wasn't on core data sheets, the majority of armies had access to it with things like Stratagems, say like Thousand Suns and their big minus one damage on their Rubrics and Scarab Occults. Again, like quite a lot of things in 40k, this one seems to be a rule that we just haven't seen anything of whatsoever throughout the 10th edition previews, including on a good few units that used to have the rule. Seems like it might have gone the same way as Fights Last and ignores invulnerable saves, and just not be a part of 10th edition whatsoever. The units that have lost it are the Space Marines Ballistas Dreadnought, so it seems that Dreadnoughts in general don't have the rule anymore. The same for the Screamer Killer Carnifex from the Tyranids, he had it on his 9th edition datasheet, and so did Mr. Bellacor as well, he had it on top of a whole bunch of other defensive debuffs. I feel like with general perception of it, I don't think a lot of people are going to be too sorry to see minus one damage gone, often felt a bit annoying to play against, and certainly made certain classes of weapons way weaker than they otherwise would have been. Maybe just felt like a bit of a bolt-on extra with the 9th edition durability and damage arms race, and perhaps something that could have been reflected in their base stats. I'll admit I did think it had some positives though, it made certain units really quite resistant to common damage to weapons, and maybe encouraged people not to lean too heavy into them as just sort of anti-everything weapons. Perhaps with 9th edition's toughness chart that was kind of helpful, as Games Workshop have said a few times during their 10th edition previews, part of the reason that they decided to stretch out the toughness chart a bit was to make sure that something like a strength 8 weapon with 2 damage wasn't just fairly effective into virtually everything in the game. It maybe was just a little bit skewed, as it was absolutely brutal at toning down the damage from things like overcharged plasma, but did literally nothing if you were targeted by damage warm weapons. Though I think it did have its perks in that it was a durability mechanic that didn't need an additional dice roll, unlike, say, Feel No Pain. Obviously, with only a few datasheets previewed, and not all of the ones that have minus one damage, we can't 100% say whether it's a thing or not still. It might just be that it's not quite as common on things like Dreadnoughts, maybe one or two factions might have it as their main thing. I'm aware that I'm recording this the day before the Death Guard preview, so I guess we'll see whether or not they have that, or a different flavour of disgustingly resilient. Let me know what you think though, would you be happy to see the back of minus one damage in 40k, or do you think that it had its place on the right units? In any case, hope you've enjoyed a few thoughts about some of the previews that we've seen of the 10th data sheets. Let me know what you reckon to them down in the comments below. I'm sure there's plenty more that I could be talking about like this, so feel free to let me know any other ideas for other things that have either been removed or seem to be common trends for buffs and things on the new data sheets. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, but I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.